going to share screen and brilliant. Okay, dokie. Now we're actually on the safety course. So uh, we've actually gone on to the inclusive skating module. And if you have a look up at the top, that's the link that everyone that's on this call is a member of inclusive skating. So you've all got access to this learning platform and we're going through the safety course uh, currently at the moment. And this is module four. So for modules one, two and three, we can do catch up. So at the end, once I've gone through some of the materials, I'll actually show you the how to access the, the safety course on the learning platform. So without more ado, let's actually get started. Uh, artificial skating assistants. Now these are present in quite a lot of the rinks and they're generally known as penguins. I personally don't like the penguins at all, particularly not for inclusive skaters. So um, what I'm going to share with you is some of the risks of using them, particularly for people with an additional need and also the equipment that we do actually have. And we've actually got some of this equipment available right now. It would go to whatever, whoever is actually managing the activity, because I would want it to be used by several people. But obviously, it would. There's more to think about in relation to how it gets managed and stored. And I'll show you some of the the resources that we've got to help you with that sort of like system. We've got things like carry bags to help with COVID, because obviously once you've used it, you're going to have to clean it and sanitize it. There's, there's a bit more to think about as well. Okay, right. Let's start up at the top. So that's giving you like a, a brief introduction. So by the end of this module, you should be able to reinforce the limitations on the use of balance aids, explain the importance of using that the balance aid matches the skate and their abilities, reinforce awareness of the risks when using a balance aid, put, a, a pl put in place a safe system of operation and supervision of skaters using balance aids, and ensure that skaters are advised to wear protective clothing when using the balance aid. Now, what you'll generally find is that when you go across to the local rink, they'll have the penguins and they're just like the kids take it, right? Now, if the kid has got sufficient uh, need for a balance aid, then they should almost always be wearing a helmet, especially if they're a beginner. And you've got to be really particularly careful that things like the chin area is protected. So, you know, going back to the point about, you know, good um, preparation that we covered last week, we advise the use of helmets which is not standard practice elsewhere. So it will be part of your preparation process to make sure that if they're going to use a balance aid, then they must wear a helmet, okay? So um, the, the penguins are really, I, I really regard them as a comfort blanket. So they're actually quite good. You know, if you've got the little tiny tots coming on, they're two, three, you know, four years of age, then basically it's just like a wee friend that's actually there with them on the ice. They're not actually there to provide, you know, proper balance assistance. One of the things that we also find is that some of the skaters with cerebral palsy, for example, they will be given excellent balance aids by their physiotherapist and from the hospital. And we find that many of the people with CP actually prefer using the balance aid that they've been given by the hospital and the physio on the ice. And we've had the physios come down to the rinks with the skaters and they actually work very well. The one general thing that if they're going to use their own balance aid, do bear in mind that um, they're going to be slightly higher if they're wearing a skating blade so that you're going to have to adjust the height. So if they're wearing skates, you're going to have to maybe potentially lift the balance aid up two inches. And usually most of them are adapted for height. So just bear that in mind. If you go onto our section on equipment, you'll actually find that we've got things like additional skating boots with additional support struts inside them, which are bespoke and made specifically for the skaters. And generally speaking, most of them are quite flat. So what you need to do is you've always got to measure what the equipment is that the skater is using with that uh, actual equipment. And if you've actually seen some of our events, you'll actually have seen some of the very, very profoundly impacted people with CP um, and how much they've progressed. You know, it's been really quite stunning to see their progress over the years. And um, we'll, we'll discuss a bit more if you've got a skater that's using their own frame, but we'll do things like have the wheelchair in at the back of them with someone actually pushing the wheelchair. So if they get too tired quite quickly, that they can then rest and then go back into their wheelchair to then come off the ice. So it might not be a case of you're only using a balance aid. It might be a combination of having the wheelchair there. We've also got things like the harness 
that's available in some of the rinks, but you've got to be very careful because that's got to be risk assessed before you use the harness to make sure that the back and the body is strong enough to be able to take the forces of actually using the harness. It's not a straightforward, just go off and use it. You've got to be really quite careful. Using an assistant as a balance aid is not a complete or a perfect solution for anyone. Skaters may still fall and or the skaters not, may not be able to use the balance aid appropriately. So as always with, with this, you've got to do an individual risk assessment for its use, and that is always necessary. Skaters, their parents, carers and associated professionals also need to be cautious. Regardless of whether a skater is using an assistant as a balance aid or not, they still need supervision. So what we see typically is that people, you know, come into the rink, the, the rink lets them have the penguin and off they go. Uh-uh, not happening on inclusive skating. They've still got to be supervised, but they've got to be supervised more because they've got something that is potentially like an XSS missile that could get directed to other people and it can itself cause problems. So, and it's a really good idea to make users aware that the assistant can itself be intimidating for other users on the ice. An assistant can take up a lot of space. Some models can make a lot of noise as they scrape on the ice, especially if the ice is rough. If it's very noisy, then this can upset skaters who need a quiet environment or who need to be able to hear the instructions from their guide or facilitator. So lots of assistance in use can reduce the safety and the supportive quiet environment for other users. So as a general rule, my rule of thumb is don't use the penguins, don't have them anywhere near the rink. If you need a balance assistant, then use one of these properly during the sessions. Okay, so here are some of the key guidelines. And bear in mind, this will be in the exam <laughs> because it's a real safety issue. So balance aids must be used carefully and appropriately as there are limitations to, to, the use, to their use. And the assistant must be designed for the surface being used. It should be used at low speed and should not generate fear and alarm amongst the other skaters. Now, the one that I've got here is actually the one that is our preferred one that we that we like. And this is a model that uh, I found in Finland. And this model has it folds flat, actually. And then this handle, and there's two different types of handle and this handle slides up and down. So at this height, that would be suitable for, for example, your little five year old. And it literally adjusts for every single height all the way up. So it, it can go really quite high. I would still be quite cautious if you had someone that was especially heavy. If someone was especially heavy, they might not be safe on the ice at all. And this might not be strong enough for them. So always be careful, particularly if there's anything unusual about the individual, make sure that they're really well balanced and that this is adjusted for their particular height. Now this model from, um, from Finland, in actual fact, has also got at these different points here, like a little triangle. It's actually got little insertions where you can put a wheel. And so this can actually be adapted to be used off ice skating and for the purposes of inline skating. And the new model from Finland has actually got brakes on it as well. So you can actually stop. Okay, so the, the, the off ice model is, um, is, is really quite good. Okay, so and that's only recently come on the market in the last uh, couple of weeks, actually. So the first uh, or the second key thing is that you must match the size and the ability of the skater. Inclusive skaters may not have the body, wrist and arm strength to hold onto or use the assistant appropriately. So make adjustments as necessary and only use the assist assistant if the height of the assistant is adjusted properly. Now, what you can't see on this particular picture is that we've actually got a different type of handle. And the I'll, I'll show you, it might be available in one of the videos I'm about to show you on the YouTube channel as well. And it's got two armrests on either side. So if you've got someone that has got very poor upper body strength and very poor ability to control with their hands, then they can actually use it as an armrest. And the whole of this little section comes out and you can put in the different handles and they can actually support it. And what's really helpful about the, the one that's got the different handles, it's also got two extenders at either end. So it's got a dual purpose. So if we've got skaters coming onto the ice who are deaf blind and they, they can't follow any of your instructions, then you can use the one that's designed for the people with no arm strength because it's got these great extendable handles on either side where you can actually guide them on the ice. 
and they, they're they're perfectly safe uh, to be able to skate and to get guided with other people on the ice. So we we can even get inclusion of the deaf and the blind, or what I would call deaf blind people on the ice as well through the use of that equipment. Okay, risk perception is a huge issue when you're dealing with this. The use of these assistants, the skater may not have sufficient understanding to push the assistant appropriately. If the skater has low perception of risk, they may swing the assistant and or themselves around and they may push it in the direction of other skaters. If the skater cannot use the assistant without putting other skaters at risk, the assistant should not be used. You cannot put other people at risk. OK, and it can be a real problem because we can have a lot of people with behavioural problems and low attention you know, deficit. So make sure that the person is appropriate to be actually using this equipment. And again, supervision is required at all times by a responsible person. Now that may be their parent, but it may not be, particularly if you're dealing with someone with behavioural problems. So you may need to have a specific volunteer designated to look after that individual. Ensure that the assistant is not pushed towards other skaters. Other skaters must not be knocked over by the assistant and other skaters must not be upset or put at risk. Ensure that the assistant is used at low speed, quietly and calmly. And I strongly suggest if you are going to use the assistants, see th th this sort of information, put it up somewhere because you will have situations when you're dealing with people on these sessions when they are misbehaving. And it's really helpful if you can see the rules say that so that you're not having to rely upon imparting the information. Use something that's a bit more official, so it's like an external authority. It can really help you out, okay? Sole use. The, skate, the assistant must be used by one person only. And I'd say that that is one of the biggest mistakes I see people making regularly, particularly if they're using the penguins. The little child is using it, and then you'll have the parent leaning over the top of the skater, and then pushing it along. And then what do you see? You see the parent having a slight misbalance, landing on top of the skater, and the skater having a really bad accident. Not allowed, okay? So our equipment, only one person is to use it. This equipment moves a lot more easily on the ice than do the penguins because it's a lot lighter and it's more stable than the, than the penguins are. But even so, only one person is to use it. Leaning or sitting on the skating assistant by another person is dangerous and can result in the skating assistant toppling over, or even worse, the additional person crushing the skater or causing the skater to fall headfirst over the top of the assistant. And that can apply to the volunteer too. The volunteer could get seriously hurt, so don't allow it. Only one person is to use it. Risk of injury. Use of the assistant carries the risk of injury. For example, even if it's being used as it's designed, the assistant can topple over or the skater can push the skating assistant too far. And this may itself throw the skater off balance and cause a fall. And the chin area is particularly vulnerable to this type of fall. So here's on the most straightforward stuff. No modifications and maintenance is required. Don't make modifications to the skating assistant and ensure that it's kept maintained at all times. Check for damage, sharp edges, tightness of screws and handles, and the skis, that's the bit at the bottom. Damage to the handles, covering, and the general stability of the skating assistant. Because when people are putting up and down, they can sometimes um, not do it correctly and bend the metal. So you do have to make sure that it's uh, remaining well maintained at all times. If the skater is using the assistant, then they should wear a helmet, chin guard, and protective equipment to minimise the risk of serious injury. Use the assistant in the manner that it's designed for. It is not a toy. Do not stand on the skis. And do bear in mind that the assistants can become an obstruction. So when it's not in use, the assistant must be removed from the rink immediately as it can become an obstruction. And other skaters may collide with the skating ass assistant. Take particular care where there are visually impaired skaters on the rink who may not be able to see the skating assistant. So it's really important that if the, the child, and the, one of the things that happens with the skating assistant is because it's quite well balanced and you can see that it's much better than a penguin because they've actually got space to skate, that they get their balance quite quickly and then they want to skate off and leave the assistant. So make sure that the person that's supervising takes it off straight away. Because remember, it'll be adjusted to this child's height. It won't be to the height of someone else. And if they're taller, for example, they might lean forward and it might actually cause them to have an injury. So make sure that, um, that you actually deal with that. 
Now, the, the list of things to do isn't exhaustive, so do make sure that, um, you know, that you think about things that could be a risk for your individual person as well. The handle, though, um, is actually adjustable. The one with the, 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 I call it, you know, the one for the, I call it the CP one. Uh, and the, the handles can actually adjust and go narrower in or narrower out. And that makes sense because when you think if they're going to be doing it with their arms, it will also depend upon the width of their shoulders. So it's really important that if they're holding it and using it in that way, that it is adjustable. So the pole is quite wide and then it slides along. You know. So if you had someone that was quite a bit bigger, I would put them on to the, using the other handles. Now, it's possible to do a wee separate certificate for this, but we're not going to bother with that because um, you're all going to be taking the, the major part of the exam, right? So oh, we've done all of that one. Right? So that's the artificial skating. Assistance. Now it's first steps onto the ice, <clears throat> module five. We're going quicker than we did last week. Right, so what every skater needs to know, by the end of this module, you should be able to communicate effectively the risks of stepping onto the rink, know when and how to get onto the ice safely, raise awareness of simple safety procedures, reinforce safety habits, and raise awareness of the skater to find their balance before they start to skate away unneeded from the barrier. Now, Eleonora, you do not need to be the best skater in the world to help someone do that. In fact, some... Okay. Someone that is just really calm and really supportive and where they're not do, doing it every day of the week can actually be really helpful. So I'm really hoping that people like yourselves will come in and actually help to share and support people coming onto the ice for the first time. Every, everyone is valuable, okay? So the general advice is that skaters and their carers and volunteers need to be aware of the risks and some simple procedures that minimize risks and promote safety for everyone. Some risks are always present, but many are avoidable. When safety is at the top of the agenda, some simple procedures that minimize risks become a good habit and provide a safe system of operation. As an advisor, you can help skaters get into the right habits now. Remember, we want all the skaters to be safe and to be able to enjoy their time. Your help and advice to skaters and those around them is helping to make their first time on the rink a memorable, safe experience, one that brings them back again for more fun. And if, if that was the thing I was to say would be my greatest message, make sure that they have so much fun that they want to come back again, would be what I would want. As an advisor, you're not meant to know everything, so be careful in the advice that you give. If you're unsure, the best thing you can do is to advise the skaters and their carers to take further advice and obtain second opinions. We don't expect you to know every risk and avoid every accident, but with your help, many accidents and injuries can be avoided. So what's the first thing that I would ask you to think about? And this particularly applies, say, for example, to someone like Tracy, who's actually setting up the, se the sessions, the volunteer ratio. Aim to have at least one volunteer activity supporter available to assist each inclusive skater when they go onto the rink for the first time. It's really helpful. Now that ratio can reduce as the skaters and the carers become more able and comfortable on the rink. So skaters should be supervised in group sizes and formats that are appropriate for their challenge, medical condition, age and developmental level, and the complexity of the activity. The precise ratio is a matter of judgment. Remember that the skaters and their parents and carers are the primary caregivers, and the volunteers are there as supporters and are not there as substitute carers. So that goes back again to our accreditation policy. The parents and carers are still going to be doing the day-to-day -day care. So how much, many people that you actually need on the ice will depend upon what they're actually doing. First time on the ice, have a dedicated person, if at all possible. And we've got, for example, in some of the rinks, we've got one person designated who's particularly good with kids with autism. And he's brilliant at getting them comfortable because he's got such a good way with kids that come onto the ice with autism for the first time. So he's the, the person that is my go-to person for a beginner. And it's not because he's the best coach or the best skater. He's just got the best way with him when we've actually got a beginner on the ice. So what you want to do is identify people that are particularly good at that particular activity. And you might have a, you know, a range of them. It's good if you're setting up a session to have a team of people. And it also has got implications for how you stagger the introduction. If you're dealing with the able-bodied kids, like when I was coaching at Ali Pali, I started 150 kids 
in week one and you had 10 groups and you know and they were all in like groups of 15 with one coach can't do that with this group what you've actually got to do is far better to actually to stagger them because they take so much more one-to-one time so you might want to start you know if you've got two spare volunteers you might start two people in one week assess them get them going and you might want to start another skater the following week so stagger the starting process okay and um one of the clubs um the the club at Slough that's one thing that they do well they only start one or two skaters each week so it does mean that there's a bit of communication as to when their starting point is okay right let's go on to the next sort of like sessions and this one is really important for everyone take your guards off your blades <laughs> The number of times, it's one of the biggest causes of accidents on the ice. So if the skater's wearing guards on their blades, ensure that they take the guards off before they step on the ice rink. And it's one of the things to always keep an eye on. Make sure you've got a volunteer floating around to make sure that a beginner doesn't step onto the ice with their guards on. Courtesy to the other skaters is really important. And the skater must step onto the, the rink carefully, ensuring that they're not stepping in front of anyone else. Ensure that the skater looks where they're going and are considerate to all the other rink users at all times. If the skater cannot see because they're visually impaired or is unaware of other skaters because of, for example, their level of autism, then you've got to make sure that they're using a guide or a facilitator at all times. And I think it's really, in help, it's really helpful to do this day one. Start as you mean to go on. And if you tell people to be careful of other people and not to step in front of anyone when they first go onto the ice, then you're putting in place good practices of courtesy on the ice for the future. Because when do you tell someone that they're not actually meant to get in someone else's road unnecessarily? Do it day one and do it as part of that process. Skaters should step onto the rink sideways and hold onto the barrier. One foot should step onto the rink at a time. So we don't want to see people doing somersaults onto the ice or jumping straight on and falling back because they might hit their back get them to go onto the ice, hold onto the barrier, get themselves their balance, okay? The, ba the rink barriers are really super because they're very robust and they don't usually move or fall over. And novice skaters should stay close to the barrier and hold on with one hand until they get their balance wherever possible. So don't underestimate the use of the, the barrier. How many times do you use the barrier for your beginners, Tracy? Yeah, all the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> They know the barriers. <laughs> Come on and you sort of like get them to sort of like make their way along the barrier to get your, you know, your group and then you get them away from it. With inclusive skating, the parents and the carers are key. Ensure that the parents and carers remain in close proximity the, to the skater at all times. No going off to get a coffee. They've got to be there. If the skater needs to leave the rink at any time, then the parent or carer should immediately resume full charge of the skater. And parents and carers should attend to all personal needs and the medication at all times. Okay, so this is not a situation where you're going to be giving them their medication. You want that parent and carer there at all times. And we can be dealing with people with quite complex needs. So don't take on too much. Make sure that you've got those parents and carers there at all times. If at all possible, we get the parents and the carers <coughs> with the skaters you know, as I mentioned. So don't underestimate the potential for them to get on the ice too and get involved and they love it. So it's really good to get everyone involved if you possibly can. Communication, make sure that there's open communication between the volunteer, leaders and coaches, and all parents and carers at all times. Parents and carers are the most valuable resource in the development of skaters with challenges. For example, if you're dealing with someone that has got episodic loss of consciousness, very often the parent will see it before anyone else sees it. So make sure that you've actually got a good line of communication because they'll alert you to the potential that that skater is about to have a fit so that you can actually respond quite quickly. Once the skater has got their balance, then they can progress to the centre of the, the rink and you can just see the joy in that skater taking their first steps on the ice, can't you? Okay, okay. Right, session management. <clears throat> what every volunteer and skater needs to know by the end of this module you should be able to inform volunteers and skaters about simple safety procedures of the session run through the basic phases of the session and reinforce the main messages in relation to safety remember that the first thing is that inclusive skaters are people first and skaters second and they need to maintain their health 
Skaters who need a bit more care need to have their caregivers around them. This means that there's lots of people around during an inclusive skating session and there's people with multiple responsibilities and challenges. So at least one person must be in charge. And obviously down in Cardiff, that's Tracy, right? But the same thing is if you're going to start any inclusive skating session, then someone must actually be there to make sure that the session is led and that the session is well managed. If the session is a small group activity, then one person acting as a leader may be adequate. If it's a larger session than many participants, then the leader may require a team and a chain of command. The important thing is that someone's in charge and directing who's going to do what. As a leader or of a session or a safety advisor volunteer, there's many things to consider. And here's just some of the factors to consider when managing a session and the volunteers. Numbers on the rink. The numbers on the rink should be safe and managed carefully at all times. Generally, inclusive skaters need more space and less skaters on the rink. Busy sessions can be off-putting and can cause difficulties. And remember, I alluded to that before, and it's to do with their slow response times. Very often, they will not be able to respond as quickly as someone else. Sometimes they might actually need someone to help with communication. For example, they might be visually impaired. So someone's going to give them directions. And they might also just not be aware of the risks. So you've got to be really quite careful about how you actually manage the numbers on the ice. Now, some of the things that fall out are normal things that should apply in any session, but we'll say them all the same. Because if you've got volunteers, then you may want to go through them with the volunteers so that there's no questions that they know that these are the rules that should apply in any skating session. And most especially with an inclusive skating one. There should be no horseplay, <clears throat> no chasing games, no kicking ice or the rink surface, no throwing ice or equipment, no sitting on the barrier or boards, no pushing, no shoving, and keep your hands to yourself at all times. So if you have a group of inclusive skaters and there's a number of boisterous children involved, then more supervision may be required. Quite happy for them all to have fun, but they've got to be supervised and they can't get carried away. No racing with artificial skating assistance or balance aids or toys. We've all seen that happening. No skating in chains. Skating in groups is only permitted when it's under the supervision of a coach or volunteer. And it's really quite important because if you put like a line of three, four skaters going around the ice and you've got people with like visual impairment or whatever, then it's a disaster. So no skating in, in chains unless it's supervised. And it could be appropriate because it might be, you know, that they're doing a synchro activity. But if they're doing that, then you, you manage the session appropriately. Facilitators should be in close proximity to the inclusive skaters. Session skaters should not skate between the facilitator or guide and the skater being facilitated. Now, that's really quite important because it's not something that the able-bodied skaters are aware of. If, for example, you've got a visually impaired person and you've got the guide, right? What you'll see if you're on a busy session is you'll see some skater and they'll think, oh, there's a bit of a gap between the two of them. I can go through them and they'll go through the visually impaired person and the guide. And then it means then that the visually impaired person has lost the thing that they are working in relation to and they get completely disoriented. Now, so that is something that the able-bodied skaters are not familiar with. So you've got to educate them. If you've got a visually impaired person on the ice and they're being guided, do not allow the able-bodied skaters to skate through the guide and the, the skater. Make sure that they skate round the guide and the facilitator. So... Um, Delayed response. Inclusive skaters may have delayed response, so session users should leave sufficient time and space for all inclusive skaters. Intellectually independent skaters, that's the ones that don't need a guide, right, may still have slow or absent response. So don't expect the inclusive skaters to be able to give way to accommodate the speed of an able-bodied fast-moving skater on the ice. The number of times that I've actually heard people that are able-bodied say, excuse me! shouting at you know top of their lungs to expect the inclusive skater to move it's not happening and the inclusive skater is not being rude they're just not able to remove if they've got slow response it's probably going to take them maybe three seconds to be able to compute that and then to make the decision as to what they're going to do and by that time then the able-bodied skater will already have done the jump and be, be, be gone and they'll be thinking that person's really rude 
they're not being rude they just don't have the capability so there's a bit of an education to take place with the able-bodied skaters who are not familiar with having an inclusive skater on the ice they can't say excuse me and expect them to move they won't do it okay but that's where the facilitators come in. The facilitators and the volunteer activity supporters will seek to ensure that the inclusive skater respects the needs of the other skaters on the rink. And I'll give you an example. My own daughter's visually impaired. So what we do is Juliana will do her jump and then we'll go to the barrier and we will make sure that everyone on the rink has got to do whatever it is that they are doing and so that they get their jump or their activity and we learn everyone's program. So then when we go off to do something, then we will do what we're going to do and then go to the barrier and then let the skaters get their turn. So the, there's a bit of training involved with what the facilitators do and how they actually give courtesy to allow the other skaters on the ice to be able to, to do their training because it's not a case of the inclusive skater gets it all their own way. They've got to respect the needs of everyone else as well. Okay, so, <clears throat> right. so the usual training courtesies rules do apply, but with some modifications to, meet, to accommodate the needs of inclusive skaters. Modifications are necessary if there are fast able-bodied skaters on the rink. Able-bodied skaters should modify their behaviour and their speed to accommodate the needs of the inclusive skaters. So they've got to give more space. Inclusive skaters cannot always give way, so do not expect them to. Able-bodied skaters should not say excuse me and expect the inclusive skater to move. VI skaters cannot see you and the facilitator will not be able to communicate a different route to accommodate a fast-moving jumper programme. The facilitator should seek to ensure that the VI skater respects the other skaters on the rink to the fullest extent possible. And they'll do that by memorising it or choosing when and where the skater is going to do the jumper spin. Getting up from a fall and avoid unnecessary standing in the rink area. Everyone should get up right away after a fall unless they're injured. Use the correct procedure for getting up from a fall at all times and move to the barrier when not actively skating or practicing. Now, the number of times when you actually see, for example, a volunteer or someone that comes on to an inclusive skating session and they start talking in the middle of the rink or they're like a steward and they start skating round, not on. If they're not actually volunteering and doing the activity, then they've actually got to stand at the rink side. And the same way, don't have a, you know, a mother's meeting, as my old skating coach used to say, you know, in the middle of the rink, get to the barrier, leave the space for the skaters, and especially in an inclusive skating session, because they need more room. So as soon as you start chatting, get to the rink side, uh, don't have a conversation in the middle of the rink. Make sure that the skaters follow the instructions of any coach or volunteer activity supporter at all times. And this is really quite important because we want to encourage respect for the volunteers that are actually on the ice. No one is to be rude to the volunteers and they've got to show respect. You know, if, we, if you've got volunteers on the ice, what they say goes. So make sure that they're valued members of the team and that you encourage all the skaters to follow their instructions and tell them that. Don't be frightened of saying this volunteer is in charge and you've got to follow what they say. So give the, your volunteers and your leaders the authority to be able to provide instructions. So if someone does start to talk, you see that they are empowered to be able to say to the individuals, if you're going to have a chat, can you go to the barrier? OK, so it's that sort of, you know, you know, don't, don't be frightened to communicate what you want. All the rinks will have local rules that apply and they should be followed at all times too. So if you go to the rink, you'll usually find that there's a big board up and they'll have like things that they particularly want. Make sure that people follow the local rules within the rink and ensure that the rules on artificial assistance or any toys are followed too. And sometimes it can be quite helpful to have toys. Like I've seen with the, the tinies, very often the, the coaches will have balls on the ice so that the little ones pick up balls as part of like their activities absolutely fine but make sure that you look after them and that when they're not in use that they get put away so that they don't become a danger to anyone else can i just go to here right now there's an end of course assessment right where you can actually take the course and if you click down to the bottom and click on that it will take you through to multiple choice questions um, in fact anyone can whiz on ahead for that matter yeah. Don't be frightened. Even although I'm going to still go over everything and still chat to everyone about it, um, 
it'll go through. And in the back of this system, it, it'll actually mark it automatically and you'll get a certificate with your name on it. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of replication of what's in the course in the thing. So it actually proves that you've read it. Um, and then you'll get your certificate and I'll get your mark and you'll go on the register of safety advisors. Right now, I'm just wondering if I can go on to, yeah, I can. This is actually one of the other resources that we've got. This is our YouTube channel and you can search for this by searching on inclusive skating, right? Cause we've got our own sort of like name and you can see the, the various playlists. And another thing that you can do is this is the inclusive skating website and we've got so many resources on on the website and um as well as uh, we'll, we'll go through other things a little bit more there's grant and lucy right but if you go down to the bottom of it you'll actually see that you've got links if you click on that you can actually become a friend on follow us on facebook twitter Instagram or YouTube. So if you click on that link, which is what I did, it will actually take you straight through to the YouTube channel. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of links available that you can move your way around the system quite quite quickly. Now we've actually got I've actually got nearly a thousand videos on the platform and there's a whole range of different things. There's everything from what the skaters actually do at the competitions, but there's also volunteer know-how. And that has got a lot of information. That's what I'm going to have a look at shortly. But there's also things like, for example, the badge skills, where the skaters, uh, what they do for badge one, two, three, et cetera. There's a little video of what all the different elements are. So you can actually follow it through the badge. It's probably designed primarily for the first one to two years because right. we actually encourage people to be taking part in the competitions quite quickly. And even if they're doing the badges, they're still invited to take part in the competitions simultaneously. So it's not a case of like with British ice skating where you've got to have passed your goal before you're allowed to, to do things. With us, we actually encourage everyone. The development pathway includes everyone from a very early stage. Right. On the volunteer know-how, right, I've actually got a big deal, right, um, which actually shows you how to put the frames up. Okay. Now this one's actually quite quite a long one. It's actually about 40 minutes, but it shows how to put the videos up, how to take them back down and how to use them. Okay. So if you're wanting a bit more information on the frames, and it's really helpful, Tracy, particularly for yourself, down at Cardiff, we'll be getting you a couple of these frames and you'll have to train your volunteers how to put them up. There's a video <laughs> and it's, it's in the playlist. So it's really quite easy to find. Okay. And there's also a video here, which I'll just go to this one as well. Now, Look to this, right? That video, I'll go a bit further along, right? That's all about how the, the COVID safety systems work. So we've obviously got our COVID policy as well. So if you've got, you're setting up a session, this is how we set up the sessions for, for COVID as well. So we would invite everyone to, to follow that. So it'll, for example, explain, you know, the location, we put everyone into household groups and such like, and we've got sanitization rules. But importantly, we really keep everyone quite segregated because we've got more people around in the rinks. You'll actually see that we've actually got a map of where everyone goes to. So they'll have a specific chair or um, area to go to put their boots on and they'll stay in their own area as a household bubble so that they're not mixing. So we've been running all the sessions and we've had absolutely no transfer of, um, of COVID. There's been no transmission events at any of the sessions because we've been operating such widely dispersed household bubbles for it. Okay, And again, there's a video there so that you can actually use that for your training, Tracy, for your volunteers. Okay, here are the courses. We've also got a whole range of different courses for you can do. So if you want to improve your coaching and understanding of what's involved with coaching, these are general coaching ones. And then the badge program is really helpful because it teaches you how to teach the basic skills as well. Right. So if you want to improve your knowledge, then you know the, the core things are now already up on the system. They're on the, the website as well. So if you go, for example, here, right, down to technical, you can see badge skills and test program. So you can actually um, download the whole of the program Right. But you can also click on the certificate. So say, for example, you're doing some of the, you know, your inclusive skating sessions down in Cardiff and you want to be able to issue 
a certificate, then you can issue that and you can put the person's name and that's free to download. Okay. Right. So you don't need to get into pay or anything. So you know, like with British ice skating, they've got to pay 30 quid to get a, a certificate or whatever. That's not the case with us. Everything's there, it's free and it's available. Okay. <laughs>